So I'll, I'll probably start here with, uh, with the, an introduction. So my name is uh, Mohammed Sehli. I'm the um, co-founder and CEO of Withak Capital Markets. Um, Withak, in a sense, it's uh, basically what we're doing. We're building market infrastructure for the Suku Capital Markets, um, offering the issuance, administration, and distribution of um, Suku securities. Um, I myself, um, you know, I come from the fintech uh, world. Basically, I've been doing, you know, fintech uh, related um, stuff, I say, for the past five years or so. Um, that is uh, that is the main thing that I do. And then, you know, before that, I was working in um, digital transformation, focusing on the financial sector, uh, you know, managing several um, large banks in the region and then some of the central banks as well. Um, most recently, Alhamdulillah, I've been named one of the people that are impacting the Islamic economy through Islamic 500 and then been recognized by the business uh, Arabia as uh, one of the top 100 people impacting or influencing the economy in UAE. Um, so that's kind of a, a brief introduction there. Uh, sure, I can, I can yeah. give an introduction as well. Uh, so hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Samim Abedi. I am the Global Head of Portfolios at Wahid Invest. Um, I've been in this role for about two years at this point, and essentially I'm looking after the portfolio construction, uh, product development, trading in all the different jurisdictions that we are uh, launching or have already launched in, including the U.S., the U.K., uh, Malaysia, Mauritius, uh, and a few others that we'll get into a little bit later. Prior to this, I traded credit at Google in Silicon Valley. So big, uh, big cash book in house and, and they needed, they needed a fixed income uh, portfolio managed. So uh, I was part of that team traded and in, in invested in high yield and investment credit. And then prior to that, I spent about six, seven years at JP Morgan where I did investment research and strategy and also managed portfolios for nonprofits. Um, so that's, that's been my, my brief decade long spiel. Uh, Maraja, we can hear you, by the way. Can you? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. You could have told me. Sorry, everyone. I uh, I got some technology lag just as I was raving about how this app is amazing. But uh, I'm glad I am uh, back online. My name is uh, Rajal Mizrui. I uh, run the DIFC FinTech Hive. It's, um, it's a FinTech accelerator. And uh, through this accelerator, I get the opportunity to work with a lot of uh, amazing uh, fintech uh, startup solutions technologies that we try to match with um, uh, financial institutions uh, from the region. And um, uh, the main point that we wanted to share before we actually get into the conversation is the introduction into Islamic finance, which is very popular in our part of the region. However, uh, might be uh, a bit new um, uh, in other regions. So the global Islamic um, uh, finance market is continuously growing due to strong investments in the halal sectors, um, uh, including uh, infrastructure and sukuk bonds. The industry is going digital and Islamic fintechs are on the rise, offering individual uh, Sharia compliance. Uh, what is Islamic fintech? Fintech and Islamic fintech are very, very similar, actually. The point of differentiation is that Islamic fintechs follows the guidelines of Sharia, which is the Islamic law. Islamic finance is a combination of Sharia law and modern banking and has become a two trillion uh, business, a two trillion dollars business over the past uh, two decades, covering everything from bonds to buying cars. According to the rating uh, agency standards and poor's, the Islamic finance industry has, in its relatively uh, short existence, grown to be worth $2.1 uh, trillion. Fintechs obviously support the growth of Islamic finance industry by facilitating easier and faster uh, transactions. Islamic fintech involves the usage of fintech utilities such as the KYC, AML, blockchain, DLT, cyber payments, uh, big data and machine learning in the digital delivery of Islamic finance. The main types of services offered in Islamic fintechs are 
basically peer-to-peer -peer lending, crowdfunding, money transfer, mobile payments, and trading platforms. In addition, there are also fintech services or, uh, for other sub-segments, such as uh, wealth management and insurance. In the Islamic finance landscape, there are a few prominent Islamic fintech companies. Among them are the Halal-focused um, uh, Islamic fintech um, the Halal Focus investment firm Wahid Invest, who uh, is uh, present today uh, with us with uh, Samim, uh, who launched the Islamic ETF in July in 2019 in the US, as well as with our capital markets, an alumni of our 2019 FinTech Accelerator from the FinTech Hive, who aims to improve the market infrastructure to support Sukuk issuance and trading, making it more easily accessible and manageable. So we've uh, gone through the introductions of uh, my two guests. Um, uh, Mohammed, uh, would you uh, please um, discuss the importance of capital markets from an Islamic perspective? Absolutely, thank you, Raja, and um, hello, everyone. Um, I mean, capital markets in general, you know, the, the importance of capital markets are evident, you know, in both Islamic and non-Islamic markets. Uh, when we talk about the sign of maturity for, um, you know, such a market, uh, capital markets always comes in the heart of that. So offering, you know, uh, different means of financing, basically, and access to um, funding, whether it is for sovereigns, governments, um, you know, companies and clients, or even to the SMEs, um, it's definitely a very essential tool. And Islamic finance is uh, not really any different, you know, from uh, needs perspective, you know, when it comes to needing funding and needing financing, you know, to, to traditional uh, financing. Uh, but when it comes to capital markets specifically in, uh, you know, in the um, uh, Islamic side of the story, I would say, even though the industry itself is growing, um, you know, and the need is definitely there, um, but still there is a lot of, uh, you know, hindering points, I think, you know, for proper uh, growth and, um, you know, accessibility to capital markets. So more specifically, when we talk about um, Sukuk, which is kind of um, a bond equivalent in the sense, you know, um, an, an Islamic bond, um, we, we look into some of the regions like uh, in the GCC, for example, between UAE and Saudi, we have a tremendous amount of debt, yet we don't have any enough, uh, you know, fixed incomes basically to invest in. So that kind of um, absence of, uh, of that market is evident. And now I think there is a, a big you know, um, uh, these countries basically to diversify and shift and go into uh, capital markets. And we can see like an example in Malaysia, you know, happening there where capital markets play a very significant role. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a big part of the economy. So how do we, you know, bring that diversification? How do we actually bring that maturity, you know, to different markets across the, uh, the um, uh, Islamic countries and even non-Islamic countries who are interested in you know, such uh, such product that uh, that that uh, you know we we could offer um, is to uh, go and build a proper market infrastructure in place, and that is definitely missing. Uh, you know, building market infrastructure and then offering that um, uh, access to uh, companies and emerging economies, emerging uh, you know countries. Uh, definitely plays a big role into bringing all of these entities into the, uh, let's say, the future economy or the digital economy in a sense, and then connecting them to, um, you know, to the global economy um, overall. So, uh, Mohammed, how is this uh, different uh, than the conventional way? Um, I mean, the difference are, are many. So, um, as I mentioned, usually when, uh, when we try to innovate, and that's been, you know, um, uh, we've seen that in the, past, uh, in the past four or five years, innovation is usually enabled by the existing infrastructure in place. So, how much can you really innovate depends on how much can you utilize of existing infrastructure. Um, a lot of the fintechs, you know, require supporting functions, requires, you know, market incumbents to help them or to allow them to utilize some of the services. And that is, um, that is, that is, uh, you know, um, a market reality, of course. So when it came to Sukuk and we are looking, you know, to existing infrastructure, not only in the region, but globally, we didn't find any um, uh, modern, let's say, infrastructure that really supports the end-to-end -end life cycle or the end-to-end -end management of a, of a Sukuk life cycle. 
And, and that was the idea where like, okay, we need to create this infrastructure in, play, in place and then allow others as well to, you know, work with us, you know, to offer uh, more and more services. So, uh, you know, we started, for example, focusing on how to create a proper central, uh, central uh, deposit, uh, central security depository, CSD, which is a very significant piece of the puzzle that we are offering or building, how to, you know, bring custody of, uh, of securities into WITAC and how to um, innovate in the way that we store and deal with these securities between the, you know, the, uh, the, the very right of having papers in place and then the very left of tokenize everything. So how can you bring a model that actually works in today's economy and it actually um, is, uh, is plausible in the sense that it integrates with the existing infrastructure. So we, you know, we focus on the dematerialization uh, element there and we come up with an innovation on the idea of uh, programmable securities need not to be tokenized, for example, and they could be dematerialized in a sense. And that allowed us to be very flexible uh, in the way we offer our securities. Um, so we allow you know, different market participants to come on board, create the security, offer it to investors, and then continue servicing that security until its maturity. So we are custodians, we are uh, you know, performing agency functions and security servicing, and we are also clearing and settling these securities. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, Samim, how about you tell us about your experience in Wahed's international expansion and had, what has been the response globally? Or maybe you can start with what does Wahed do? I just assumed everyone knows because you guys are very popular so far. Absolutely, I appreciate that. So uh, in a nutshell, we are, we are a Sharia compliant robo-advisory platform. Uh, <clears throat> what that means is Folks sign up to the platform through a very streamlined process. They assess their, their their risk tolerance, their liquidity needs, their time horizon, and they select some of our one of our uh, risk profiles that kind of their their funds are invested in long term. We tend to have a, a very passive equity bias, and then paired with gold and then some sakooks, obviously, are important parts of the portfolio. Um, and and hopefully thinking of ourselves as 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 you know, championing some sort of vanguard in the Shadia compliance space. But um, where there's gaps in offerings as well, we do launch our own products. And we're going to talk about about the Halal ETF that we launched a little bit later. But in a nutshell, that's what we do. Um, it's it's a bit of an ambitious project. And our CEO, Junaid Wahidna, has, has really done a great job in this. I mean, the the Islamic or Muslim market in air quotes, if there is such a monolith, hasn't really been catered to directly. It's also, it's often been, regionalized and and also incidental you know I, I spent a lot of time at jp morgan um they certainly have mina presence um and, and some apac presence but there was no deliberate sort of attempt to cater to this demographic and uh folks often would shy away from it either from a resourcing and roe perspective or or just you know on a priorities list but we've really embraced it and we've gotten mixed feedback so we obviously started in the us we moved to the uk and then we looked at some countries abroad uh, with the emerging markets and the GDP per capita being obviously very different in those regions, uh, some folks were obviously skeptical, but I think, alhamdulillah, we've been very rewarded by that experience. Um, there's a huge need just by sheer population sake. I mean, we're talking about a half a million between India and Indonesia, the GCC sort of, you know, a fraction of that as well, Central Asia and kind of greater Russia, which people don't really think about is the Muslim republics there and, and the former Soviet Union uh, numbering in excess of 100 million people that demand halal clothing and food and, and import all these things and by natural extension need financial literacy and, and ways to build their wealth. Um, and then obviously Europe and, and, and Nigeria and, and those areas as well. So the need is certainly there. And I think I am proud of the fact that we've really embraced it. So Malaysia is a case study our strength is in our numbers. It's become the fastest growing region. Um, I think the government, the people that really welcomed us and, and established a partnership with us. And, uh, you know, we're, we're no longer, or not that we ever were, we're, we're not really hesitate, hesitant in any way of embracing an emerging market economy, these frontier markets that, that they sort of label us as. So um, we may have situations where kind of the, the, the more affluent regions will subsidize other regions, but we are a solution that hopefully has an impact focus on it. 
not just Sharia in the sense that it's negatively screening different sectors and ratios and debt, but the spirit of what we're trying to do is provide access um, and, and provide some sort of even playing field for folks to be able to invest their funds. So uh, I think I think so far so good. Uh, I think also it's important uh, that it's uh, very easy to use and you can start from uh, minimum values for uh, investment and you can do it all through the platform. So that gives accessibility to a wider um, uh, slice of the investors or the investors want to be who could start investing from a hundred dollars onward and and somewhere they can monitor over their phones and you know uh, just be close to that information because usually you invest your money and you don't know where it's going what's happening with it no absolutely i think you know we're we're in a mobile age and we're in a digital age i think that uh the the days of you know physically mailing a check to a mutual fund i think are, are probably uh numbered and so these digital mobile driven applications and platform. I mean, it's not just the future, it is here. And so we've really embraced it. We have a very talented tech team that's pushed out applications that's available, I think, largely to, to most of the world at this point that folks can answer. And to your point, we do have $100 minimums. And obviously there's a thought in that we have people that are across the socioeconomic spectrum that either have some manual labor or sort of in college and students to, to clients that are obviously fall in the high net worth, ultra high net worth category. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the access is important to everybody and the ability to service people across that, uh, that strata is super important. And, and, and it's really the goal. So, uh, so proud to, to be a part of that there. So uh, you have a very interesting um, case study about the first e ETFs that was debuted and uh, was uh, at the time of the first Sharia compliant stock ETF. Do you want to give us a quick um, uh, summary around how that was initiated and what was the process of really rolling that out? Absolutely. I mean, if, if you follow the trends of passive index-based investing, um, iShares and Vanguard have made a fortune over the last 10, 20 years doing this um, by pushing out index-based, low-cost uh, investment solutions, essentially going on the theory that it's very difficult to outperform the market consistently over time, so we should really just own the whole market and, and set it and forget it. Uh, there's no reason that shouldn't apply to the Islamic finance space as well. So in the U.S., there were a few funds to their credit that did service the community, um, but it was more active mutual fund around 1% expense ratio and concentrated, relatively speaking, 30 to 50 names. Uh, this was obviously a void in the market. Uh, we saw it as an opportunity, but also an obligation to kind of push something out to service this. And, you know, we we talked to different index providers. I mean, everybody from MSCI to S&P to Dow Jones, um, because with the Muslim community, alhamdulillah, uh, we rarely think one thing about anything. So we have to uh, really vet index methodologies. We have to vet uh, the Sharia methodologies. Um, obviously you wanna go with a very robust and thorough Sharia, uh, Sharia methodology to leave the, the spout open to the widest array of investors, right? You wanna be more, I, I hate to use the word because it's simplistic, but in the absence of it, more conservative approaches, um, that, that really capture the spirit of the rules. A lot of these rules aren't rules for the sake of being difficult. Ultimately, we're trying to invest in companies that are operating with good governance, um, you know, companies that aren't leveraged enormously. So anyway, that was the process of picking an index provider. Um, we made the ticker super easy for people to remember. It's Halal, H-L-A-L. So, so no excuse on a complicated yeah. ticker. And we partnered ultimately with FTSE Russell and NASDAQ. To, to be our underlying index and, and also the exchange that ended up listing it. So it, it's been great. The reception's been very strong, both in the United States as well as internationally. Uh, the benefit of being listed in the US is folks abroad can buy, buy it as well with, with certain restrictions. Um, and, and so, you know, so far so good. We're actually, today is the one year anniversary of the launch. Actually, congratulations. thank you. So, uh, so here we are one, one year later. Congratulations. So um, I think we have uh, a few minutes left and I would like to use this uh, time to really talk about how Dubai is positioned to support Islamic uh, fintech. 
uh, obviously I am based in Dubai and I work with startups from all over the world and from um, uh, infrastructure uh, uh, perspective and from an ecosystem perspective, from an entrepreneurial culture that has been uh, developed and embraced by uh, Dubai. It has enabled a lot of um, uh, startups to come uh, set up their offices in Dubai and expand globally from there. Uh, the Islamic economy sector contributed about uh, 41.8 billion to Dubai's GDP in 2018, registering a growth of 2.2% over the previous year. The increased contribution of the Islamic economy to Dubai's GDP and is, uh, is an organic outcome to Dubai's uh, expertise, advanced infrastructure, strategic geographical location, and its commitment to becoming the preferred investment uh, destination for various Islamic economy um, sectors. The UAE today ranks fourth globally as an Islamic fintech hub. And uh, since we've launched the fintech hive in 2017, we've been scouting for Islamic solutions because we know that through Dubai, they would be able to access their target uh, customers and uh, population. Dubai is one of the largest centers globally for Sukuk listings by value, $68.35 billion, with $49.06 billion listed on Nasdaq Dubai. The UAE's highly entrepreneurial culture, investment, strong business uh, support were identified as uh, key factors that have positioned the country as an attractive hub for Islamic fintech. And uh, younger customers are expected to play a crucial role and, and the region has really young population uh, that will support the growth of Islamic fintech and expand its customers' uh, base. Now, based on Withaqs and uh, Wahed, and both of you are based in the DIFC, would you be able to give me, Mohammed, your perspective on how Dubai is really connecting your solution with your consumers, given the infrastructure regulation and so forth that's put in place to support that. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Raja. Um, I mean, more specifically, I would say, you know, the reason why we chose Dubai to start uh, with, basically. So we started, you know, within Dubai, the IFC, which was the, you know, FinTech Hive as well as a starting point because, um, you know, there was a very specific and a clear vision. I think, you know, um, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, uh, you know, um, uh, basically wanting Dubai to be the capital of Islamic, uh, you know, Islamic economy. And that, uh, that vision actually, you know, been supported by, I think, every, every single institution that exists, you know, within Dubai, you know, to not only scout for Islamic fintechs, but to actually enable Islamic fintechs to connect Islamic fintechs. And, um, you know, that is, that is our experience basically with the FinTech Hive, you know, we've been, we've been connected to, I would say, all of the financial sector in Dubai. That made it very easy to us to access all of the, you know, banks, um, insurance companies, asset managers and the rest. And that saved us a lot of time, you know, to bring awareness to what we are trying to do, to have access to um, uh, whether investors or potential clients and, um, all of that connectivity is is definitely you know meaningful and needed for um, anybody who's trying uh, you know starting in the uh, in the industry. So um, that's uh, that's a very practical experience that we've gone through. So it's not just uh, you know my my thinking or expectations of what's uh, you know what to come, but it's actually the experience we went through you know in 2019 and continue going through as well you know as we speak uh, with uh, with with the DIFC and Dubai. Uh, you know, to, to support Islamic economy and Islamic fintechs. Um, and that's, uh, that's hopefully the, uh, you know, the vision where we continue basically, you know, pushing the envelope forward, you know, to, to make sure that we achieve that vision of, um, you know, Dubai being um, the, the capital for Islamic economy, inshallah. Thank you, Mohammed. Samim, you said you've been in Dubai every once in a while for, for business. Tell me, I was so excited, first of all, Wahad did not join the Accelerator program, but they joined the FinTech uh, Hive co-working space. And, uh, you know, uh, having a company like Wahad with us really uh, sh showcase the infrastructure that we've put in place to enable these uh, FinTechs. So would you tell me a little bit more about Dubai's experience and maybe your global pipeline for growth? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, even though the idea for Wahad was, was sort of... Uh, incepted in, in New York City, where I'm from, I'd like to, you know, claim that partially, but, you know, there, there's a reason the headquarters is Dubai. I mean, um, I'd like to echo, you know, Sidi Mohammed's comments of, of really the, the government, the leadership has been very supportive, but 
I think more so it's not it's not just supportive and a passivity, but but it is truly thinking big about what this could be and not limiting to just you know small projects here and there, but really thinking thinking transformatively has been great. Um, the ability to, to to source talents and have so many folks, both local and expat, um, in that region to be able to pick their brains and partner and and discuss, be it funding, be it, you know, JVs and, and any of that stuff has been really invaluable. Um, and I am based in New York, but but we do try to get out there as often as possible. So, um, you know, looking forward to after the the world returns to some sort of normal. To really centering centering that collaboration and partnership back in the region. We will switch places. I'll come to New York and you come to Dubai. <laughs> and shall, you'll have you'll have a slice of pizza and I'll have a shawarma. So yeah. <laughs> that's that's how we'll end off. Thank you, Mohammed. So I'll just uh, touch on some other examples of of Islamic fintechs that came out of the DIFC fintech hive. Uh, accelerator program. There's a company called Hello Gold who develops the world's first Sharia compliant gold mobile application. Uh, there's a company called Islami Chain. It's an innovative startup leveraging blockchain technology to enable philanthropic, compassionate giving. And Hakba, an Islamic fintech startup specialized in cooperative uh, savings in addition to Wahid and uh, Witha. Uh, the Fintech Hive Accelerator partners with special or organization that include uh, Dubai Islamic Development Center, Emirates Islamic Bank, Dubai Islamic Bank, and Abu Dhabi Islamic Bank to help drive the growth of Islamic fintech startups uh, in the region. Uh, we try as much as we can to engage the financial institutions with these technologies because we believe that we have already shifted to a digital uh, age and um, you know this, there's no way these institutions would be able to sustain their growth uh, without collaborating with the uh, promising technologies like yours. Uh, I would like to thank you Mohammed and Samim for joining me on the panel today and uh, I would like to thank our audience for joining us if you have any um, if you would like to know more about any of us I think our bios are there or you can come to fintechhive.ae and I'll be more than happy to connect you to Mohammed and Samim thank you so much thank you Raja thank you Samim good luck on the rest of the conference talk soon guys talk soon take care